Say together, repeat our proposal. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. for you to bring out your best and to uh, show off your, your baking skills and so and that goes to a good cause obviously it helps send youth and children to camp and so please um, please be willing to be a part of that uh, also vacation bible school it is coming up quickly uh, june uh, 3rd through 7th our kickoff is on the 
second, and so please plan to be a part of that. Um, workers, for sure, will be a part of the kickoff, so we can introduce ourselves to uh, the kids that are coming. So, uh, that's all I have. Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it fitting that we started off singing Heavenly Sunlight? Amen. <laughs> hey, it's got to where we don't see sunlight an awful lot of times, and it's beautiful out there. Right? Amen. Amen. Join me as we pray. <coughs> Father, as we come to you this morning, Lord, we, we just uh, are so grateful for all of your blessings for all of your grace and mercy. And we're, we're grateful for this sunshine that we see today, Lord. And for the way that we see you move in our world. Father, as we gather this morning, I, I pray that you would help us to really focus upon you. To lay aside all those things that concern us. We all have them. But Lord, right now it's just time to focus on you and what you want to say to us. So we ask you to help us that we will hear what you have for us and that we won't just hear it with our ears, but we'll hear it with our hearts. And that we'll respond to what you're saying. We lift up Brother Mike as he brings that message to us, Lord, that you have given him. We lift up the choir and the congregation as we sing praises to you, Lord. We pray that our worship will be pleasing to you. And we ask you to just help us to be the people you want us to be. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> As we get started this morning, did y'all find me yet? There you are. Uh, I wanted to invite any of our kids that wanted to to come and, uh, and join with me. Uh, those that are going to Children's Church, if some others want to, I will just tell you, I'm going to give out prizes today. So if you want one, you got to come up and help me out this morning. All right? Anybody going to take me up on it? Okay. There you go. All right. I'm surprised Tom Wolf didn't jump up here. Did he jump up here? Okay. All right, here's what I want you to do. My, my instructions are real simple. All you have to do is follow me. And whatever you see me doing, that's what I want you to do, okay? All right, so if, if I go, you go. If I stop, you stop. Whatever I'm doing, you do, right? You got it? Real simple. Here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to follow me. Are you going to help start off? Okay, you're going to start right here. So here's what I want you to do. Y'all just follow me, okay? Just line up to follow me, okay? All right. I thought Christian was behind me. You moved back on me, did you? All right. I told you I'd give you something. Now, y'all have one and sit down just a minute. Take one, grab one quickly, okay? There you go. Grab one and sit down. Go ahead, grab one and sit down. There you go. All right. Now, see, some of you missed out. You're going down. Let me just tell you something. I don't want to find any of those rappers in the church. <laughs> Alright. Or on the van. Or on the van. Put them in your pocket, save them. If you eat them in class, throw the trash can away. Throw the trash away. <coughs> but you know what? I had 
throw the trash away. Throw it in the trash. You know what? Very simply, what I asked you to do was something that was just very direct. Just do what I do, follow me. You know what Jesus said over and over again to those who heard Him preach and teach? Follow Him. He said, follow me. Follow me. Take up your cross and follow me. Follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. He again and again called people to follow Him. Now here's one of the things that sometimes we don't understand. There is always a reward for following Jesus. You will never regret not following Jesus. Did any of y'all who got up here and followed me a while ago, did any of y'all regret getting something? Are you glad that you did? Guess what? Whenever you and I follow Jesus, there's always a payoff. It's always good. We will never regret following Jesus. Do you know what we'll regret? We'll regret those times when we didn't follow Jesus. And that's not just true with these kids. That's true with all of us today. My prayer is we would hear God speak to our heart today. That whatever He is telling us, whatever He is saying to us, we will be obedient and we will follow Him. Let's pray these kids would learn that lesson, but let's pray we would all learn that lesson today. Father God, again I come and I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for its truth. And Father, thank You that Jesus called us to just follow Him. And in following Him, we know the blessing, we know Your favor, we know Your grace, we know Your help. Father God, I pray today that You will speak to all of us about what it is You want us to do as we would follow You. God, we pray that You help these boys and girls learn what it is, even as a very young age that it always pays to follow you. And I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. As far as our younger kids, you can be dismissed to Children's Church right now. Brother David, we're so proud that he's here leading our, our morning worship service. So Brother David, if you please. Let's stand together once again and continue to sing God's praises. Be
one time with prayer. done ex exceptionally well. And uh, yesterday was no, uh, was no exception to that. Uh, the theme this year was old time country western is the theme. And, uh, and so they had us dressing up uh, a little bit more casual. I wore blue jeans. And in fact, I thought, you know what, that's what I'll be wearing on Sunday morning someday. Uh, when you get comfortable. But but it, it was good. Now, they made fun of me wearing the little hat. But that's okay. I'm used to y'all making fun of me. <laughs> I am. But, uh, but this morning, as we consider God's Word together, I want to kind of take off from that theme. Old time country western. Today, I want to talk to you about old time religion. And, uh, and as we look in this passage, we're going to see that there are several truths that the Apostle Paul uh, presented and, and taught in Athens that relate to us today. You know, it may have been centuries ago when he said what he said. But what he said all those years ago still applies very much to us today. And I pray we'll hear it in God's Word for our life today. Would you stand with me in honor of God's Word? Acts chapter 17, we're going to be beginning in verse 16. Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons in the, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some Epicureans and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler 
wish to say. Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and they brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. And we wish to know therefore what these things mean. Notice what it says in verse 21. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul standing in the midst of the Areopagus said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along, I observed the objects of your worship. I found also an altar with the inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown in ignorance. This I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by men. By man. Nor does He serve by human hands as though He needed anything since He Himself gives to all men life and breath and everything. And He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries for their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him. Yet He was actually not far from each one of us. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed His offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not look nor to think that being divine is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by art and imagination of man, the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now He commands all men, all people everywhere to repent because He has fixed a day on which He will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has appointed. And of this He has given assurance to all by raising Him from the dead. Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, we will hear you again about this. So Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed. And among them were Dionysus, the area guide, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. Would you pray with me? Father, today we look to you to take your word and speak it to our heart. Father, today, there is a need not to hear what Mike Titchworth has to say. There is a need in this service to hear what you would speak and say to each heart in life. And God, as you alone can, I pray you would take your word and help it to come alive. Help it to be relevant as you speak it to each of our lives. God, draw us to Yourself. Help us to go away, even from this service this morning, more committed to following You and living for You and serving You and bringing glory to You. As we would pray it together in the name of Your Son, Jesus, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. Now, if you're not familiar with this passage of Scripture. Let me just kind of help set the stage just a little bit. The Apostle Paul is on his second missionary journey. And he's just left Thessalonica. He's just left Berea. And by the way, Berea is my favorite church in all the Bible. Do you know why? Because it was the church that when the Apostle Paul taught and preached they searched diligently every day to see if the things that he was saying were true. 
I tell you, that's the way every church ought to be. Don't just take what the preacher has to say when he stands up and preach. You check it out with the Word of God always. Now, as I go through this passage, I, I notice that the Apostle Paul has come to Athens. And the very first thing it says is that his heart was stirred by what he saw. He was burdened by what he saw. He saw a city that was filled with idols. In fact, historians would say there were over 30,000 idols in this city. Now, at the time Paul is there, historians would say there's about 10,000 people living in Athens. At one time, there were 300,000 people living in Athens. But it had declined. It was Rome left it as it was, but it wasn't near what it was in its glory day. In its glory day, it was the Yale, the Harvard, the Oxford, the, the learned city. Because, have any of y'all ever heard of a guy named Socrates? If you hadn't heard of Socrates, maybe you heard of his student, Aristotle. If you didn't hear of Aristotle, maybe you heard of his student, Plato. I, I can just tell you, all those great philosophies and philosophers, this is where they taught. Have any of y'all ever heard in math about the Pythagorean theorem? A squared plus B squared equals C squared, or times A squared equals... Anyway, not, <laughs> I didn't write it, okay? But the guy, Pythagoras, who wrote that, this is where he did his mathematics. This is where Epicurus and and, uh, and just a lot of different famous people that people study and talk about even today. This is where they were from. This was a super prominent city in its day, but it was known for its idolatry. If I ask you, what's the greatest sin in all the world? What do you think the greatest sin in all the world is? You remember what the greatest commandment is? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your might. Let me tell you. You remember the very first commandment? Thou shalt have no other what? The very first one. I can just tell you the greatest sin is idolatry. And don't think that that's limited to just back then. We have our own idols today. Whatever comes between you and your relationship with God, that's an idol. He came into a very pagan world and pagan culture. God had led him to carry the gospel for the first time into Europe. And his goal was to eventually one day get to Rome. And he does that, but not quite the way he had planned on doing it. But here he is, he comes in. Here is this pagan culture. Here is a city filled with idols. And he's trying to figure out how to reach this city. And he finds a statue that's to the unknown God. Now it's kind of interesting how the history of the statue to the unknown God came to be. There actually came a plague, a sickness through the region. This is what history would say. And many people were dying and they were trying to figure out what do we do? What God do we need to appease? And here's what they came up with. They said, we're going to turn sheep loose in the city and whatever idol they lay down close to, that's who we're going to sacrifice the sheep to. But then the question was, well, what do you do about those sheep who don't lay down near any idol? Well, you sacrifice that one to the unknown God. And they erected a statue to the unknown God. The Apostle Paul walked around and saw all this and saw the paganism. And he said, you know what? The one you worship in ignorance, I've come to tell you about. And His name is Jesus. Now here's what I want you to see as we work back through this passage. I want you to consider with me four basic truths that you and I can gain from an old-time religion 
as shared by the Apostle Paul many, many centuries ago that still apply to us even today. And the first of the things that I would point out to you is that it's not enough to be religious. As I said, they had all kinds of idols, but know what the, notice what the Apostle Paul had to say to them. There in verse 22, he said, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, he said, men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. Now, I meant to tell you about the Areopagus. I forgot to. The Areopagus was a meeting place. Another thing about Athens, just to give you the Parthenon, if you've ever heard of that, that was in Athens, one of the seven wonders of the world. But up above Athens, on Mars Hill, there was a meeting area known as the Areopagus, and that's where the leaders would come together to discuss important matters, and that's where they would gather to hear new teachings. And as it said, they were always looking for something new. I tell you, isn't that what we're doing today? Everybody's looking for something new. The newest fad, the newest whatever it is. He had an opportunity to speak in the Areopagus. He'd been preaching and teaching at the synagogue, but he spilled out from there and they said, hey, we want you to come speak where everybody can hear what you have to say. And the very first thing he says to them is it's not enough to be religious. He said, you're a religious people, but he's going to tell them being religious is not enough. And I can just tell you that was true then, that's true now, today. Because there are an awful lot of folks who have religion, but they have no kind of real relationship with God today. The problem with religion is that religion relies on human goodness. Religion relies on human effort. Religion relies on human accomplishment. I like how Adrian Rogers used to put it. I've quoted him before. He said, the worst form of human badness is human goodness when it becomes a substitute for the grace of God. When we rely upon what we can do instead of what God can do. Do you remember what Jesus said to one of the most religious people of His day? A fellow by the name of Nicodemus who was a Pharisee, who was probably a member of the Sanhedrin. He said, you must be born again. He's saying, on your own, you have no hope of pleasing God. Now, I googled it. Do you know how many religions they say there are in the world today? Now, this is according to Google, and we know they never get anything wrong, okay? <laughs> Over 4,200 different religions registered in some form or fashion in the world today. Can I tell you what's the difference between religion and Christianity? True Christianity. Religion is all based on what you and I can do. Christianity is based upon what Jesus Christ has done. Amen. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life. And Jesus Christ went to the cross and died not for His sin, but for our sin. Right. He was buried and He rose so that through faith and trust in Him, we can know forgiveness of sin and have the hope of eternal life. That we can have a living relationship with the living Lord. Amen. It's not what we can do, it's what He has done. When, when Paul came to Athens, he said, you need to quit relying upon what you can do, and you need to trust and that God has provided His Son, Jesus Christ. And then he says, he proved it even for His resurrection from the dead. And that's what really got their attention. They thought, wait a minute, we've never heard anything like this. Let me tell you, there are many people in this world 
who are not privileged like you and I are to hear about Jesus. What's sad is that there are so many people even here in Benton, Arkansas, maybe even here in this congregation today, you heard it, and you heard it, and you heard it, but you've done nothing about it. Let me tell you, it's not enough that you have your name on a church roll. It's not enough that you've been baptized. It's not enough that, that you serve in some way within the life of a church. And if you're a child of God, you ought to want to serve within the life of the church. None of that matters when it comes to where you're going to spend eternity. It's what have you done with Jesus Christ? Have you put your faith and trust in Him as your Lord and as your Savior? Let me, let me go on to the second truth we see illustrated in this. Not only that it is not enough to be religious. The second thing he emphasizes is the need for repentance. Repentance. Look at verse 30 and what he has to say. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He commands all men everywhere to repent. That's it. Right now we're living in a day of grace. But that grace is not going to last forever. And when he talks about repentance, it's more than just turning away from what's wrong. But it's turning toward what's right. It's not just turning away from sin. It's turning to Jesus Christ. It's more than just saying, I'm sorry. It means I'm sorry enough that I really want to change. And at the root, that's what the word repentance means. It means I'm willing to change. It means a change of heart, a change of mind, a, a change of will. It means I'm willing to change the direction of my life. It means I'm willing to change my allegiance from living for myself to living for my Lord. Can I get political for just a minute and just tell you? One of the problems with the mass immigration that's taking place in our southern border is that there are many, not everybody, but there are many who want to come on their own terms. They have no intention of living by our laws. They have no real desire to become a citizen of our country. They don't want to change their allegiance or their loyalty. They just want the benefits, not the responsibility. Does that make sense? Can I tell you, it's that same way with Jesus Christ. There are an awful lot of folks who want the benefits there are an awful lot of you. When I did that little thing with the kids and I had a bag of cookies and treats in it, how many of you after I did that thought, I wish I'd have gotten up there? <laughs> See, JR is smiling really big. He thought, man, I miss you. You know what? There are an awful lot of folks who want the benefits, but they don't want the responsibility. That they don't want to change their allegiance. Repentance means I'm willing to change. I can't keep going the way I'm going and go with Jesus Christ. I've got to turn around. And I've got to commit to go His way. The Apostle Paul, here he is, among the leaders of Athens, such a prominent city. And what does he tell them? He said, you need to repent. And, and understand, to repent is not a negative word. It's a positive word. When, when I thought, why is it that people don't want to repent? Three things really stand out why people don't want to repent. I dealt with someone this week who's not wanting to repent. And that's because he doesn't want to give up his control. 
he, he, it's, it's a pride issue. You know what the Bible says about our pride? In Proverbs 4, verse 27, it says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is death and destruction. I can just tell you, pride will not get you right with God. Pride will not put you in a place to know God's blessing. It will, it will keep you from knowing God's blessing because the Bible says God resists the pride. And so I've got to be willing to let go of my pride. Another thing is, is people are willing, unwilling to repent because they're afraid. And I've talked to people about the Lord that, that they're under conviction and they know God's dealing with them, but they're I'm afraid of what this is going to mean. I'm afraid of what my family or my friends or other people are going to think. I'm afraid of how this is going to change my life. Let me tell you, when you know the love of God, the perfect love of God, the love of God casts out fear. Amen. Because you realize all He wants is your blessing. Is your, your best. That's all He wants from us. And then, the God of this world has blinded people's eyes. And so they remain ignorant of what God means. And of how He's not against them. He's not against you. He's for you. He's far better as He calls us to Himself. Were any of y'all inconvenienced by all the rain we've had over the past month? I can just tell you, as bad as we may have had it, there are places in this country where roads were washed out, where, where houses were lost, people were devastated. Let me just imagine, we had all that flooding and all that rain now just imagine you're going down the road and somebody tells you you need to turn around. And you go, no. You know what? I'm going to do it my way. And they tell you, you need to turn around. The road's washed out. The bridge is washed out. Your car will get flooded out. Don't go this way. Well, they're being awful negative, telling me what I can't do. I'm just telling you, that's the way some people are with God. They think that God is against them. Let me tell you, God is trying to protect you. Amen. Repentance is not a negative world, it's a positive world. I, I, I'm so grateful that we serve the God who sees what's coming our way. And if we'll listen to Him, He'll direct us, and He'll guide us. And one of the things that He will do in the life of those who are serious about following Him is He will call you to repentance. And that's not just true of those who don't know Christ. That's true of you and I. Too. Have any of y'all had to repent since you became a Christian? <laughs> this past week, was the National Day of Prayer. And there were many people last year, there were over a million across this nation. I don't know what the stat is for this past Thursday. But there were hundreds of thousands, if not over a million people, who prayed for this nation. And y'all remember what it says in 2 Chronicles 7, verse 14? That my people, who were called by my name, will humble themselves and pray. Notice that if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn, repent of their wicked ways, then I'll be for them. I can just tell you, what limits the blessing of God on our land is not the lost people. It's God's people that are not fully living for and He calls us to repent. And when the Apostle Paul is there, the most positive word he could say to these people caught up in idolatry was, you need to repent. You're headed in the wrong direction. You need to turn around. You need to turn toward the living God. 
And then he follows that up. Notice the very next verse. Verse 31 says, Times of ignorance God overlooked, but now He has commanded all people everywhere to repent. And notice what it says. Because He has fixed a day in which He will judge the world. You remember what it says in Acts, I mean in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27? It is appointed to man once to die, and after this what? Yes. And then we can look over at Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, and it talks about one day there's going to be a great white throne judgment. I can just tell you. I pray none of us have to appear at that great white throne judgment. Because it will not be a good judgment. It will be a judgment of those who've never put faith and trust in Jesus Christ. As I said a while ago, we live in the day of grace. But God's grace is like a rubber band. And I started to use that as my children's message today. And I thought, I'm going to have one child hold one end of the rubber band, and we're going to stretch it to see how far it would go till it pops. And I thought, if it popped their way and I heard a child, y'all would never let me hear the rest of the last day. <laughs> but I can just tell you, the grace of God will only go so far. And we are living in a day of grace. But the most dangerous thing any of us can do is to take that grace for granted. I was trying to think of how to illustrate that. We have all kinds of train tracks in Benton. Have y'all figured that out? We have lots of trains. Now I tell you, is there always a train traveling down the track in our city? No, not in our city. Somewhere there is. It would be possible that, that one of us could just walk for an extended time down one of those tracks and not see a single train. You know the most foolish thing we could do? Let's say we walk 30, 40 minutes down the track. There is no train anywhere and we get tired. And we decide, oh, I just think I'll stretch out for a few minutes. That'd be foolish, wouldn't it? Because it's not a matter of if there is a train coming. It's a matter of when that train is coming. And just as soon as I would fall asleep, that's when that train would show up. <coughs> it would be too late. Let me just tell you, there are an awful lot of folks that are sleeping on the railroad tracks. The judgment of God is coming. None of us knows who. And let me just give you one other thought to go along with that from the Bible. You know when the Bible says Jesus is going to come again and when the judgment of God is going to fall on this earth? When you and I least expect it. And therefore the admonition of Scripture is you and I ought to always be let me tell you, the Apostle Paul comes to Athens and he tells them, hey folks, it's not enough to be religious. There is a need for real repentance. You need to be aware of the certainty of the judgment of God. It's coming. And then one more thing. He emphasized the importance of personal faith in Jesus Christ. And when he did, notice what happened. It says in verse 32, Now when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked Him. You know what? There are always going to be those who reject Jesus. There are going to be those who, who mock Him. Who belittle Him. I talked to someone just yesterday who very quickly let me know he didn't want to hear anything I had to say. That's okay. I didn't get rude with him. I thank him for letting me talk to him. 
I can just tell you, there's some that are going to reject it. I also want you to notice what else. There were some that said, we will hear you again about this. There's some that are going to say, I out and out say no. Some who are going to say, I'm not sure. I want to learn more. But no, there's another group. And Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him, and they believed. They believed. It's important that you come to a place of personal faith in Jesus. You can't worry about what other people do. There are some people who are going to out and out reject you. There are some people who are going to delay making any kind of decision whatsoever. It doesn't matter what they do or they don't do. In eternity, only one thing is going to matter. What did you do, Jesus? When you and I stand before God, He's not going to ask about our parents and their faith, our friends and their faith. He's going to ask, what have you done with my son, Jesus? Have you accepted Him? Have you trusted Him? Maybe today you're here. Listen, you're hearing an old-fashioned message from an old-fashioned cow preacher. And I'm telling you, if you don't know Jesus, you don't need to put it off. Amen. You need to do it. You need to put faith and trust in Jesus as your Lord and your Savior. And the Bible says, Behold, today is the day of salvation. Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, again I come and I thank You for Your Word and how Your Word continues to speak to our heart. Even words that were spoken centuries ago, God, they still resonate with us today. Father, You're the only one that knows our heart and our life. There are some here today who have trusted in You and there's no question about their commitment to you this day. Well, Lord, there are others here that they've been thinking about it. They've been considering it. But they've never said it. Father, we pray today you would speak to hearts and let them understand this is the day and this is the time that they need to put trust in you is their Lord and Savior. And then Lord, there's some of us who've trusted You, but we've not been really living for You. Father, I pray that today You would convict us of anything that stands between us and where we need to be in our relationship with You. That You lead us to move forward with what You want in our life. God, if there's sin that needs to be confessed, if there's an area in which we need to be obedient, God, we pray you would work your will in our life as we come to this time of invitation and response to your spirit, to your word, in Jesus' name.